Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Baum. I'm a ranger here at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. And as a part of our virtual programming for our 240th battle anniversary, today I'm speaking with John Moss. Specifically, what we're going to be talking about is the research he did while writing this book right here, The Battle of Guilford Courthouse, A Most Desperate Engagement. Uh, Mr. Moss, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, to jump right into it, my first question actually is about you. Uh, would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, your overall research interests, and some of your uh, prior projects? Sure. <clears throat> uh, I currently work on the staff of the new National Museum of the U.S. Army, which is at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, currently closed, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully toward the middle or end of the year, we'll be back open again. Before, I've been there about three years, and before that, I was with the U.S. Army Center of Military History, which is in downtown Washington, D.C. at Fort McNair. I was there for about 10 years, and before that, I was a graduate student at Ohio State working on my Ph.D. in early American and military history. Fantastic. And as far as research interests, um, mostly I, I almost do exclusively 18th century military history. Um, when I was with the Center of Military History for the Army downtown Washington, I did a lot of other things, um, uh, Civil War, modern operations, today's Army, things like that. But as far as the projects that I do uh, on my own that I'm interested in, uh, I've written about uh, North Carolina and the French and Indian War. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about the uh, beginning of the Yorktown campaign uh, between Lafayette and Cornwallis in Virginia prior to the siege. I uh, wrote a guidebook for Virginia um, sites related to wa George Washington. So it's really in my articles, my dissertation, almost all 18th century and almost all in the South. Okay. All right. Which I guess kind of answers my next question then. Um, so if you're focusing on the 18th century, you're doing a lot of stuff around the era of the American Revolution. How did you choose to do Guilford Courthouse and the Southern Campaign as the subject of a book? But also, how did you choose the scope? Because I know that's something a lot of historians have to deal with is how far into the weeds do I want to try and lead people? So what, what kind of made you decide to do this book and do it in this way? Well, that's a great question, and it's a good question for any any writer, author, historian. Um, I've always been interested in, the, interested in the South in the Revolution. I lived in the South most of my life, including Winston-Salem, for about four years. So I was a volunteer at the Guilford Battleground, uh, Battlefield Park. I um, My in-laws lived in Greensboro, and I'd go over to the battlefield all the time. Um, and probably the more I learned about Nathaniel Green, the more interested I became in the final three years of the Southern campaign, the Southern theater of operations, I guess would be a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you probably know this and many of your listeners uh, probably will too, but it seems like a lot of the books from the 50s through the bicentennial and even, even through today, many of them, they will detail the revolution going from Lexington and Concord, then another chapter on Long Island, then another chapter on Saratoga, then a chapter on Brandywine and um, Germantown, then um, Monmouth and Valley Forge, and then at the end, there's one chapter on the South, okay? So, and, and they go from Great Bridge uh, or Moores Creek to Yorktown. And after Yorktown, apparently nothing happened in the South until the Civil War. So <laughs> it was, I'm, I'm firmly opposed to that model. And uh, I think things have gotten better. If you read uh, some of John Furling's books on the overall scope, um, much better, uh, much better job these days. So I'm, I'm really convinced there's a lot more to be done um, on research and archaeology and finding places. Um, you know, unlike the North, <clears throat> where all the battlefields basically, I'm sure, are known um, and, and where they are in the, in the landscape. But, you know, I think it's telling that in the South, some of the skirmishes and even 
fairly significant engagements, historians and archaeologists don't know always exactly where the battlefield is. Uh, I think swampy terrain has something to do with that, lack of records. Um, so there's a, there's a lot more we can do. And Guilford, to me, Guilford was, was one of those opportunities. Yeah, and I, I absolutely know what you mean when you say that. Um, specifically, when I've tried to do, you go back to look at anything somebody's written, uh, special studies on, for say, example, logistics. That's exactly how they structure it. You get chapters on Valley Forge. You get chapters about the campaigns around New York. And then the entirety of the Southern campaign is one chapter and you're done. So I, I completely agree with you. And I definitely agree that, especially with specialized books, people like deep diving into personalities, we're seeing a lot more of that now. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll see even more coming up on the uh, 250th of the revolution, yeah. just a few years away. I agree, yep. And so for my next question, we'll dive right into the research you did to the book. Um, focusing on the Southern campaign, uh, can you tell us what exactly is the situation in the South by the summer of 1780? Specifically, when Henry Clinton is leaving Charleston to go back to New York, what is the situation he is handing over to General Cornwallis? So uh, Clinton left for New York in the middle or end of June, 1780. By that time, the British had already started to push out into South Carolina to occupy some of the outposts that they intended to use to control uh, the, the Patriots, uh, Whigs, if you will, American forces and, and militia and, and uh, territory. So they established Cornwallis, uh, even before Cornwallis took over, um, who, by the way, he and Clinton were not on speaking terms by the time Clinton sailed away, and I'm sure Cornwallis was glad when he left, uh, but the, uh, they established uh, posts at Georgetown, Sherraw, Rocky Mount, Camden, 96, and a few other smaller places uh, to, to occupy South Carolina. And to a large extent, he was, uh, Cornwallis was successful uh, for quite some time. Um, and that was true even more after the Battle of Camden, uh, where Cornwallis's smaller army defeated General Horatio Gates and his mixed army of Continentals and militia uh, and routed them and basically really crushed all resist all meaningful resistance in South Carolina by mid well late August of, of 1780. And so from what you've seen and what you've read, uh, would you say, how, how is Cornwallis viewing his strategy? Is he kind of on board with the hearts and minds uh, strategy or is he, you know, what, what's he thinking basically? Well, if not then, definitely by the time he got into North Carolina, he was, he was totally convinced that they were not gonna get droves and droves of armed loyalists to show up in camp and help fight the, the, the patriots and the, the cause of independence. Uh, he was very unrealistic. I mean, he was, he was a realist in that he thought the others had unrealistic expectations. Um, and you have, to, you have to occupy what you conquer. So if you, if you come into town and um, all the loyalists come out and greet you and feed you and, and congratulate you, but then as soon as you leave, the Patriots come back and they've got a list of everybody who, who wasn't on the right side, that, that's not gonna help. And um, in fact, in one of his letters prior to um, the Battle of Kings Mountain, he thought, he, he, it was his opinion that uh, Major Ferguson's force of loyalists that eventually got wiped out of Kings Mountain, uh, before that Cornwallis thought it was a, it was a fool's errand, that, that they, weren't going to be valuable, that these loyalists were after uh, revenge uh, and loot, and that it, would, it, it was really a waste of resources. Um, so I don't think that he, <clears throat> he, was, he put much stock in that. He needed to defeat uh, rebel military forces in the field. And when he had beaten Gates at Camden and started to move north toward Charlotte, um, that was his objective, was to catch up with, with Green and Morgan and other forces 
uh, try to defeat Thomas Sumter in South Carolina. He was after a military victory. Yes, and so uh, that kind of, in some way, so we have an idea of how he is looking at this. Let's kind of jump the, over to then who he's going up against. During his time as an independent commander, he's really facing off against two uh, major guys trying to control the American army mm -hmm. in the South, Gates and Greene. Can you tell us about who these guys are and what, what makes them distinct uh, leaders? Well, Horatio Gates was a former British officer that actually had fought in the French and Indian War uh, here in America, wound up uh, taking up a residence in the lower Shenandoah Valley in what's now West Virginia. Um, he was considered, at this time, he was considered the hero of Saratoga. Uh, he was the general that took over in, at Saratoga uh, to eventually cause the surrender of the British forces under Burgoyne. Uh, so at, at one point in the war, he was the most successful, successful general, uh, including over Washington. So Gates was transferred down to uh, the Carolinas, the Southern Department, which was Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, the Carolinas and Georgia, and uh, arrived in North Carolina at the Army's uh, uh, camp um, in southeastern North Carolina. And at that time, uh, took a controversial decision. Well, actually two controversial decisions. Number one, to move immediately on Camden. Uh, one, he, he was barely in camp before he asked for a, a uh, uh, roll call, a roster of the men, um, and uh, what they would call in the 18th century a return, and uh, assumed that he had 7,000 to 7,500 men. Uh, he was quickly disabused of that notion. He had a little over half that and said that that's enough for our purposes. So, and then to his approach to Camden was from that kind of southeastern part of the state of North Carolina. Uh, his, his, the, the man, the officers in the army with him who had been there for quite a while urged him to move west to Charlotte and then on Camden through the Waxhaws. But instead he took a direct route, which had been picked clean by loyalists and, and uh, was very inhospitable, um, very difficult to get supplies. And of course, he was he was defeated at the Battle of Camden uh, due to largely due to uh, a very questionable deployment of his troops, which is a, a, a story for another day. Um, but wound up fleeing the battlefield with his men, um, and it was able to regroup part of the forces. Not so many of the militia troops, but. He did have several Continental regiments, uh, Maryland troops, Delaware troops, uh, some cavalry, and wound up uh, coming to Hillsborough, North Carolina with most of the, the remnants of the army by early September, uh, 1780. Now, after that, so Gates is, is largely uh, criticized for um, his, his rapid retreat to Hillsboro, um, his deployment, but uh, he was able to get going again. Uh, he was able to get supplies, start getting the troops back into some kind of condition, trying to use the cavalry, uh, the militia, mount, really actually mounted militia. Mm -hmm. uh, but Congress and particularly the South Carolina delegates to Congress, uh, they had seen enough of Gates and they urged Gates, uh, excuse me, they urged Washington to appoint uh, a new commander. And this time Congress allowed Washington to appoint a new commander. He, uh, he was not allowed to appoint Gates. That was a congressional decision. And um, this time uh, in October, middle, middle of October, 1780, Washington chose Green. Uh, Green had been with him from the siege of Boston uh, to, to all the way to um, uh, in 1780, uh, becoming the commander of West Point, uh, the garrison and the, the defenses at West Point. That was his, his assignment that he only took up a couple of weeks beforehand uh, before he was assigned the 
position in, in, as commander of the Southern Department. And Green, Green had a couple of, um, he had a couple of attributes that I think ensured, well, that contributed significantly to a success. Number one was determination. He, he was very persistent and he, was a, he, he held that job in the South where there were virtually no supplies, no arms, few troops, no money. And he held that position for three years. His, his determination, uh, his letter writing, as, as you've probably read many of his letters are a lot of times optimistic uh, sometimes uh, funny, sometimes, you know, amusing. Um, and then the other attribute I think he had was he had, he had served as the quartermaster general of Washington's army for several years against his desire. But he did a tremendous job of, of uh, rehabilitating the logistical situation in the North. And if there were, were any theater in America that needed somebody who could work logistical miracles, it was the South because yes. it was it was depleted of everything. There was no manufacturing um, to speak of other than a couple of, of local ironworks here and there, some bigger ones up near Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, the main ports of the South, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, had been occupied, Savannah had been occupied since 1779, uh, Charleston since May of 1780, uh, Wilmington from January through November 1781. It was difficult to get supplies. So um, he, he's very admirable. And as you and I were speaking earlier, um, there needs to be a definitive biography on Green and there needs to be a modern definitive biography on Gates as well. Uh, those two, I think, are just begging for, uh, and, and, and there's no way, there's no reason not to write one on Green because his papers are, are very accessible. Um, so, you know, maybe one day we'll, we'll get one of those, I, I hope. Oh, absolutely. Because something that actually comes across in your book, I think, is I think the way a lot of the way we talk about Camden is that as soon as Gates loses Camden, it's obvious that it's over him for him. But I think in, in what came across very well in your book was that, as you said, he does try and get things rolling again, try and get, restructure his army, and it appears as though it doesn't automatically seem like he's expecting to be replaced. He's he's kind of suspicious that it's going to happen to him, but he doesn't right. think that you know the writing's on the wall yet. C correct. And he had to keep the man in the field. Um, there was no one coming anytime soon. And he, you're right, he did suspect it. Um, but by the time Green uh, arrived at the army's camp, Gates had brought the army over to Charlotte again. He had forward outposts at, at uh, Providence uh, in, and, and some even into South Carolina. Um, so he was trying to do what he could to make at least some show of a force to at least be something as a symbol of the cause of independence. Mm -hmm. um, but as we know, he was he was relieved. Yeah, yes. And so, so to jump, jump ahead a little bit in time from the next mm -hmm. question, the race to the Dan, it's been getting more and more attention lately and you do a great job of bringing it to attention in your book. But for the race to the Dan, for anybody who might be watching this who isn't familiar, essentially the period right after the Battle of Calpin is when Cornwallis is chasing Green through North Carolina and he's evading battle this entire time. And he successfully does it. And my question is to you, what is, what is the most important factor in helping Green successfully evade this enemy who is desperately trying to get after him and bring him to battle and deliver, like Cornwallis is essentially trying to deliver another Camden style knockout blow. So what, what enables Green to slip away from him every time? Well, Green had to put a water barrier between his force and the British to be safe. His force was, was, was uh, fluctuated in size, but um, the Continentals needed a lot of help 
uh, getting back on their feet after Camden in the winter. Uh, he could never rely on the militia. Um, so he was always trying to put a barrier in between his force and the British. So um, when the British burned their, their baggage at Ramser's Mill on the west side of the Catawba, Morgan, Daniel Morgan, commanding part of Green's army, was on the east side. So what happened when the British forced their way across the Catawba at Cowan's Ford, Morgan retreats to the east through Salisbury and back across the Yadkin. So there's another water barrier. And uh, Cornwallis knew this. And so he had burned his baggage at Ramsar's Mill to lighten up his forces. He, um, although you could argue that staying at Ramsar's Mill for, I think, three days or part of three days, that mm -hmm. didn't help him catch anybody, right? Yeah. Um, so, and then I, I don't necessarily agree that the race to the Dan started after Cowpens because Green was bringing his forces to Salisbury. That's what he was trying to do. So um, in late January, Green moved personally with a few, a few dragoons to the, to the Catawba area to confer with Morgan and, and see how to defend that river. And in the meantime, the remainder of his force had been camped near Shiraw and they were moving north up the PD slash Yadkin River to meet and group at Salisbury. But once the British forced the, the um, Catawba, that plan wasn't gonna work anymore. Mm -hmm. So Green instead made Guilford Courthouse, the crossroads, the, the rally point or the, 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 um, the place to regroup and consolidate his troops. I believe it was more after the British crossed the Catawba the Green realized he was going to have to get away and get closer to his own supplies up in Virginia. And that's really, that's really where the decision was made. Now, it doesn't really matter whether he, he did it on January 20th or February 3rd or what have you, but uh, once he made that decision, the, 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 the biggest reason for success is he made a light force out of his two cavalry components under William Washington and Light Horse Harry Lee, the Continentals under Otho Holland Williams, which were which were Maryland troops, mm -hmm. and uh, the Delaware Company, about sixty or so other mounted men, a handful of others, and uh, used them as a decoy to trick Cornwallis uh, into thinking that that was the rear of his entire column. So. They started the the that American group of uh, light light uh, troops started moving north toward Dix's Ferry to try to convince Cornwallis that that's where all of Green's troops were going to cross. And Dix's Ferry is just downstream from today's Danville, Virginia. Well, Cornwallis took the bait. So while the light troops went north toward Dix's Ferry. Green and the rest of the troops and artillery and wagons, they moved northeast, heading to, cro to, the, to the crossings of the Dan, that were called the Lower Crossings, uh, near today's South Boston, Virginia. Uh, there were two ferries there, Irwin's Ferry and um, Boyd's Ferry, which, and Boyd's Ferry is right at modern uh, South Boston. So Cornwallis took the bait and started chasing uh, Williams and the light troops, but Williams then moved over to follow Green and to guard the, the, uh, the, the tail of Green's army. Uh, to make a long story short, and, and, a, and, a, and a very interesting story short, um, the, it, was a, it was a close run thing, as Shakespeare would say, and um, Green was able to cross the river on the 14th of February, and so was Williams a, a few hours later, ahead of the British by something, I can't remember exactly, but probably six or eight hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you are correct that um, there has been some new work on the race to the Dan. I, I, I want to particularly mention a book that has come out since mine was published, 
uh, on the campaign through the race to the Dan from basically Camden, Cowpens, and the race to Dan called um, to the to the end of the world. Yes. And, uh, I I cannot recall who the author is on that one, but I've read it recently. I was very impressed. He did a great job. He's a great writer, and there's some good maps in there, and I'd highly recommend it. And one more thing I will say about the race of the Dan. Hopefully, I'm not doing too much on the race of the Dan, but uh, many writers back from, uh, especially kind of the uh, the early 1800s, even and especially in the 50s, with these heroic stories of of the revolution and and. Um, uh, even even modern writers, some today, uh, one book in particular that I read a couple of years ago that I was not impressed with, uh, they portray the race to the Dan as, and now this may be natural in North Carolina, but they portray the race to the Dan as a NASCAR race that, that, was, uh, that was almost as if it were televised and the whole country was watching and waiting for Green to win the race to the Dan. Um, that is completely untrue. Now, it was a dramatic event in its own right, and especially for the participants, right? But in the state of communications in the South, with no newspapers, um, very indifferent mail service and poor roads, most of the country knew nothing about this for, for months after it happened, so. Yeah. And so, so we've kind of gotten Green across the Dan River. He gets into Virginia. Cornwallis comes back to Hillsboro. Green can't allow him to stay there. And that next time they bump into each other, a major thing that's going to happen is what we today call either Pyle's Massacre, Pyle's Hacking Match. Can you tell us uh, what effect this event has on the campaign? Right. So that's where, um, depending on who you read, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee and his, and his men who... Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta read Light Horse Harry's memoirs with care. And it's always good to have other uh, witnesses, supporting witnesses. Um, he was writing a very long time after the war. Um, anyway, his troops kind of were mistaken by uh, loyalists for Tarleton's Legion, a British cavalry regiment, or, or I guess you more call it a squad, squadron, or, or unit, or whatever, um, because Tarleton's men wore green coats, and so did Light Horse Harry Lee's, uh, and Lee positioned his troops along a roadway uh, in, in near Burlington, what's today Burlington, and, and Alamance, North Carolina, in that that area, um, and and then gave a signal to attack, and they attacked. And, and killed dozens and dozens uh, of, of loyalists at that location, mostly with swords. It was very bloody engagement. Um, so to answer your question about the effect, that really was, that really was the last uh, nail in the coffin for loyalist support in Piedmont, North Carolina at this time. Uh, once, once that many loyalists were not only defeated, but, but numerous killed and severely wounded that eliminated really any hopes for loyalists to to um rally around the standard the the union the union jack and and in hillsborough and i think it says a lot if you look at the roster of uh, or the the order of battle at guilford courthouse there were no loyalists there uh the only loyalists there were tarleton's legion and a lot of those guys were from up in the north or continental deserters. So there wasn't really any main contingent of loyalists to help them um, after Pyle's hacking match or Pyle's massacre. Absolutely. And so, but to stick with the, this topic, um, kind of a more historian's viewpoint of it is, how do you think we should look at Pyle's hacking match, Pyle's massacre, when we compare it to something like the Battle of the Waxhaws, which everybody knows and associates with Vanster Tarleton. Mm -hmm. And how should we look at it when we compare it or contextualize it just to the violence and atrocities that are going on in this war in general? 
<laughs> well, let me let me answer that broadly. Um, my dissertation was on North Carolina and the revolution, and a lot of it was about the violence between Tories and Whigs. And um, it's difficult to overstate the, the level of violence and murder and arson, particularly in by the 1780s um, in North Carolina and spilling over into South Carolina. And, and you've probably read some of Green's descriptions where he says they, they attack each other like birds of prey and that there are whole districts in the Carolinas that are basically burned out and um, you know destroyed and that the Whig Tory violence that these Tory and Whig units, uh, some of them not even with commissioned officers in charge uh, would use the war as a excuse to settle old land disputes and and uh, uh, family squabbles and things like that. It was it was a civil war, <coughs> and there were there were other areas in the colonies that were like that too. Uh, that area between New York City and Albany, and uh, um, it was particularly that way. Some areas around Pennsylvania, but this area, that area in Central North Carolina. Uh, I came across um, looking in court records, dozens of cases of of people brought up before the the quarterly sessions of county uh, court court sessions and accused of something. Dozen witnesses show up. Yep, he's a Tory. He killed such and such a guy and burned his house out. And back then they didn't have what was known as an appeal. So you really had about four or five days before you were strung up and that was it. Um, so it was it was very violent. Um, one book I would recommend if people are interested in, in more on, on that is Wayne Lee's uh, Crowds and Soldiers in Revolutionary War North Carolina. It's an mm -hmm. excellent book. Um, hard to believe it's almost 20 years old now, but uh, that is that is a very, very powerful study of exactly what I'm talking about. No, I absolutely agree that that book really did kind of help me re take a new look at the war in general. It was a great book. Yep. Um, and so then moving on to our next question, uh, focusing in on the Battle of Guilford Courthouse itself. So we finally get to the battle. I'm not going to ask you to try and recount everything or tell everybody <laughs> all the events of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. What I am going to ask is, so it ends up, we, the way we describe it is it's a British mm -hmm. Pyrrhic victory. They take the battlefield, they lose a quarter of their army in the process. What to you, to you is the most important point in the battle or the most important factor, the most important person? What to you is the tipping point that leads it to be a British Pyrrhic victory as opposed to a total British victory or an American victory? Well, <clears throat> I would say Green's decision to pull back to Speedwell Ironworks on Troublesome Creek uh, that really, I think, was the, the moment where the British had to win. I mean, the, if, if Green retreats, Cornwallis wins by 18th century tradition and military tradition. Um, and in some ways, Green's, Green's uh, army was in very good shape other than one regiment. Um, he had, on, on his third line, he had four Continental regiments, and from left to, from his left to his right, the second Maryland, the first Maryland, the first Virginia, and the second Virginia, and the second Maryland, which was actually not the original second Maryland that that was famous for its its prowess up north, but a, but a newly recruited unit unit from all over Maryland. So the men didn't really know each other very well; they didn't know their officers. And they were hit by the second guards and routed. And the second guards were, in Cornwallis's words, something along the line of uh, show too much enthusiasm uh, and, and kind of overran, went beyond Green's lines toward the courthouse to um, chase the Marylanders and get the artillery. So, but Green, other than that, I mean, that's, that's a significant uh, 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 part of the battle. But 
Green's Virginians on the right had thwarted the 33rd when they came up, uh, up over the, the rise down into Hunting Creek, uh, the little vale there. Um, Green's North Carolina's, most of North Carolina's militia did not perform well in the first line, um, but the Virginians uh, did an outstanding job of going toe to toe with the British and the Hessians on the second line in those woods. And um, so that by the time the British came through Green's defense in depth to the third line, his plan had worked very well. They were bloody, they were, they were, um, they had casualties running low on ammunition. Um, William Washington's uh, cavalry charge from the rear of Green's line around that left flank uh, into the back of the guards, that, that was a tremendous maneuver. This, you know, this wasn't the, the same kind of folks that were fighting at Camden. This was, this was uh, quite an effort. Mm -hmm. But once he, once he knew that the second Maryland had fled the field or at least been pushed back out of the action. Uh, he decided, and, and there's some uh, Babbitts and Howard in their excellent book, uh, Long, Obstinate and Bloody, uh, they, they do a good job trying to uh, uh, analyze when Green really knew that his flank had been uh, uh, routed and and if he did know that the first Maryland was doing remarkably well, but here's where caution. He decided that 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 um, that discretion is a better part of valor, and he had gone. And uh, you probably know the t how long the battle lasted more than I did—an hour or so. Uh, he had gone quite a long time. Uh, his most of his army was intact. Um, and decided we are going to live to fight another day. And I think that decision uh, was very mature. Uh, it showed that he was an experienced veteran. Um, would Anthony Wayne have done the same thing? I don't know. Uh, would Lafayette have done the same thing? I, I would definitely say no. Uh, I think Lafayette in his um, lifelong uh, search for glory would have rolled the dice and said, everybody forward, let's, let's try to win this thing. But I think it was a very prudent decision. I think that was the, that was the, the tipping point in the battle for, in my, in my estimation. Okay, all right. And so um, then my next question is, uh, cause you changing gears again a little bit, you mentioned, well, earlier talking about light horse Harry Lee, you, you need to take it with caution, you need to have other witnesses to confirm what he's saying. So throughout your work, you consult both a lot of primary and a lot of secondary sources. And in the process, you actually take the time to point out myths and explain the reality behind them. You don't just put out, you know, this is what I came across. You let the reader know, hey, this is how it's been interpreted in the past, but here's what we know now. Um, what are some of the most persistent myths that you had to come up against? Or what are the ones that you think are probably stuck in the most that yeah. require the most work on. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's two really, and one I cannot take credit for. The one, uh, the first one is uh, the myth that the um, first Maryland and the second guards in their battle down uh, at the base of the third line in that Hunting Creek uh, little vale in there, they were intertwined and it looked like the Americans were gonna get the best of the guards and Cornwallis ordered his artillery to fire into this mixed melee of, of Continentals and British redcoats. Okay, that is that is untrue. That is an incident that did not happen. I uh, rely totally on Babbitts and Howard, who did an excellent job tracing that down and really analyzing where that came from. And a lot of it came from accounts. 30, 40 years after the battle um, by people who might not even have been in that area to see that going on. So um, I summarize that very quickly because um, uh, Larry, Larry Babbitts and Josh Howard, they deserve the credit for it. They, 
they have a, a very, uh, well, pretty extensive discussion on that incident in their book. And I, I believe in my footnote, I refer people to that, to their work. Um, and that, that is a very persistent myth. Um, and I think, you know, when I was younger, I remember going to Guilford Courthouse and I, I think there was even an interpretive sign on the trail about that incident back way back when. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was very, you know, it's one of these things very, very well known. Um, the, the, the one that I believe is, the, is, is very persistent and I, I try to go through uh, great lengths to, to rebut this myth is that uh, Green decided well in advance that he was gonna fight a battle at Guilford Courthouse and that he decided this when the army was camped there before the race to the Dan, mm -hmm. and that somehow, I believe they were camped there on February 8th and 9th, that mm -hmm. on the 9th, um, that this was going to be where it wound up, and that it was foreordained, um, you know, no contingency, uh, no historical contingency in that interpretation, and that he and Cornwallis were maneuvering between Guilford and Hillsborough, for two or three weeks there, and and all along the the, the Haw River and uh, and uh, High Rock Ford and those areas, and that uh, eventually Green got to Guilford Courthouse on March fourteenth, and Cornwallis obligingly played his part by marching to attack him, and that's how the battle happened, and that Green had had already identified that. Now, did Green identify Guilford Courthouse as a, as a strategic location? Of course he did. It was on the main road, the old Salisbury Road, which in, in your area is the New Market, uh, excuse me, New Garden Road, mm -hmm. uh, had uh, other roads coming in, the Reedy Fork Road that went north, um, uh, that it was a strategic area, it did have high ground. Uh, it, was, it was largely, but not completely wooded, which would have prevented the British from um, making strong bayonet attacks uh, through the woods. It would have prevented uh, Tarleton's legion from attacking anywhere it wanted to. Um, but if you read the primary documents, Green, um, Light Horse Harry Lee, a Virginia officer from the Virginia troops named, named St. George Tucker, uh, a few other uh, Cornwallis's correspondence, um, some of the pension applications. There are numerous sources that demonstrate, including Green's own, own reports, that he was on the offensive on March 14th. He was not, he did not move to Guilford Courthouse to set up a defense in depth battle, which of course, it did work out that way. But on the afternoon and the evening of the 14th, he had been he had been reinforced during that week with militia from Virginia and North Carolina, a few continental troops. He was moving to attack Cornwallis. And Cornwallis, by that point, uh, was uh, at a place southwest of Guilford Courthouse called Deep Creek Meeting House, which actually a modern version of that Quaker Meeting House still exists, and um, people people from the area uh, who know that area, it's it's near, oh, basically the Jamestown area, um, kind of between Jamestown and High Point, but closer to Jamestown, I would say. So Green was was going to move on the morning of the fifteenth and begin his his advance against Cornwallis's position, but before he could do so, Cornwallis's men they began to move to attack Green at about three in the morning. So once Green got the, got the word from his scouts and cavalry that, hey, um, Cornwallis is coming to, a, to attack, he, the whole army's on the move, then Green decided, okay, I'm gonna deploy my men defensively and, um, and we'll see what happens. But there's, there's, there's countless books, articles, websites, blogs, um, comments in comment sections that, that allude to or, or, or overtly state that 
that Green moved to take up a defensive position uh, at Guilford Courthouse, and that's simply not the case. He was a, he was acting uh, on the offensive. So to, con to continue on with the, on this thread of dealing with myth dealing with multiple points of view and accounts of the battle accounts of the campaign. Let's say somebody reads your book and they want to do their own <laughs> deep dive into the Southern campaign. Can you say, is there a source or two you, you would absolutely recommend they have to read? And are there any sources that you would absolutely warn them about or like <laughs> buyer beware about? <laughs> um, well, obviously Green's correspondence and for, for people who don't know, it, it was published uh, in 13 volumes, um, <clears throat> transcribed, not, not photocopies of original letters. So it's annotated. Uh, uh, the, the volumes that cover Guilford Courthouse were mostly edited by um, uh, Dennis Conrad, who all, all researchers in the Southern campaign, and all researchers in the revolution, uh, o, o. Conrad and, and uh, Sh Richard Showman, who preceded him, uh, an enormous debt uh, for that painstaking work. Mm -hmm. So um, they are very accessible. Um, the indexes are good. Um, the maps at, in, in the inside covers a uh, few mistakes, especially in North Carolina, but generally reliable. But that's a tremendous work. I would also uh, recommend the um, Colonial and State Records of North Carolina. And that's a 26 or 28 volume set mm -hmm. that when I was um, at Ohio State doing my dissertation work, uh, you had to use the volumes. Uh, and it covers, <clears throat> you know, co colonial records, state records. Uh, but it does a great job of covering North and South Carolina because North Carolina was intricately involved with South Carolina during the revolution. And it has letters from, you know, some of the more obscure North Carolinians like uh, Lillington and Sumner and uh, Robison and Benjamin Cleveland and, and Rutherford and all these folks where if you were going to track down uh, Rutherford's papers or something like that to, do a biography, uh, you'd be looking for 20, 30 years. But since, since, unfortunately, well, fortunately for everybody else, but unfortunately for me, after I finished my dissertation, all those records were digitized by UNC. <laughs> and I was able to use the digitized versions for uh, the Guilford book and also my book on uh, North Carolina and the French and Indian War. And uh, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents. And whoever was compiling them, Wal uh, uh, Walter uh, Clark, I believe, uh, is who did that, a judge from Raleigh in the 18 1880s, uh, uh, really was a, was a forward-looking uh, individual because he, he also went to British records and included copies of what the British were writing about. So a lot of the Clinton Cornwallis correspondence during this period is in these in these volumes, and uh, a lot of what we we get for Gates in the South is in these volumes, and they are easily accessible. They're on UNC's website. Uh, I'm sorry, a a UNC website that's called Documenting the American South, mm -hmm. and if you if you enter in Colonial State Records of North Carolina, it pops up, and you can sort them by date, by volume. Uh, by by uh, the writer and the recipient. Um, one other source is the uh, Library of Congress, I believe, has the um, Founders Online, uh, mm -hmm. which is a website. And that, again, you can put in uh, anything to or from Nathaniel Green or just Nathaniel Green to Thomas Jefferson. And by date, uh, that is remarkable. That is quite um, That is quite a source, too. As far as stuff to avoid, um, I won't mention anything modern because I don't think that's really fair. Uh, my opinion on a book may be totally different than somebody else. Um, uh, but just some of the, uh, Tarleton can be a little bit self-serving. Um, uh, Harry Lee was a self-promoter. Um, but again, if you, 
to use an army word, if you triangulate and you know you try to get, uh, let's say you, you're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the cavalry actions on the New Garden Road prior to the battle. Well, you want to look at Harry Lee, okay? But you also want to look at Tarleton and kind of put those together, but you want to come in from other angles too. Yeah. And if you can get other sources to either back up or refute or something, that'll help you out. And even if it's a, you know, <laughs> even if all these sources turn out to be a dog's breakfast in a way, you can at least write that in your book that Tarleton says this, but Lee thought it was earlier or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's where a lot of the pension applications come in. Um, I should mention that as a source. Um, a lot of them are online at various websites available free. They're searchable, but the search engines aren't always reliable. So a lot of times, uh, if I had a couple of hours, I would just pull up the website that I used for that and put in keywords. And sometimes I'd put in the same keywords, you know, two or three weeks later and get different hits. Um, now, remember, a lot of these guys were writing 40, 50 years later. And a lot of them were just trying to prove that they had been in service during the revolution. So many of them are, are along lines of, um, I, I mustered with Captain Wilson's company in Salem and served three months, went home, mustered with so-and-so, again, was drafted here. Uh, and and then, then you'll, you'll get something that's so tantalizingly close, like fought in the, in the Guilford battle. That's what they called it. The Gil mo almost all of them referred to, to it as the Guilford battle yeah. and um, saw my brother, John, wounded. Well, oh, my God. There's no detail about the wound, what unit he was in at the time, where they were. But, but every once in a while, and, I try, and, and Babbitts, Larry Babbitts and Josh Howard did a great job of this. And I tried to, to really push it uh, to nail down the details about the weather, the roads, the mud, uh, when they were resupplied. Um, one interesting fact I'll give you uh, about the, the pension applications is that um, it seemed like everybody knew that Troublesome, Iron, uh, Troublesome Creek and the Speedwell Ironworks, that was the rally point if they had to retreat because almost everybody mentions it. And later, they also mentioned very interestingly that because of the food issues that once the battle was over, a lot of the militia were discharged between Guilford Courthouse and Speedwell's Ironworks, that they were just told, all right, there's not going to be another battle. We're not going to attack again. But they were dis discharged immediately and told to get out because there was, there was not nearly enough supplies for them. One, it, it doesn't help illustrate the battle too much, but one other thing I, I also remember seeing come out of a whole bunch of people's punch applications is when asked about their discharge papers, almost always it's like, yeah, somebody gave me something and I don't know what happened to it. Yep. It's like, yeah. and it's, it's funny to think that, later, right? yeah, it's, it's so much later, but also at the time it's like, they kind of thought of it as, well, I need to, if somebody challenges me, I need to be able to prove it. Right. But once that time yeah. passes, they're just like, whatever. And, and, yes, and who knows some what they they could have been written on, uh, you know, uh, old wrapping paper, or cartridge paper, or something like that. You never know. It's, uh, yeah, very mm -hmm. interesting. All right, and so uh, I only got one more question for you. Okay. And that is going to be, you. I mean, so you already have such an established background researching the 18th century. Did you still come across anything while doing this book on Guilford Courthouse that surprised you, caught, caught you off guard, or changed the way you viewed the War of Independence? Um, as far as the battle, that the, 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 the point that I was making a few minutes ago about Green being on the offensive, I did not know that before I started writing that book. And that's something that really isn't talked about in Babbitts and Howard or a few other modern books recently. Um, so I was, I was pretty surprised at that. Um, and I, 
I, I, I find it fascinating to read Green's papers anytime I really can get the chance mm. because they're just so, um, you know, if you compare them to Washington's papers uh, and correspondence and even the ones that were marked private, he knew, he knew they were going to be saved and researched. I mean, he had somebody on his staff the entire war saving his papers, you know, he knew that there were, that there would be the basis and so the, his letters are much more formal. Um, they are more like reports than letters. Uh, whereas Greens, you can you can really get to his character, and the, some of them are emotional. Um, uh, and you probably know this boy was he angry at the North Carolina militia after the battle because in his papers there's about five or six letters in a row where he uses almost the same language every time that he. He, he said to Washington uh, um, about a quarter of them fired two shots, a quarter of them fired one shot, and, fifth, and half of them fired nothing at all. Uh, you know, you, you have to come up with a sentence like that to be, you know, to be kind of lyrical. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, did, was he, he was livid about that. Um, but I think anytime you do research on the uh, original records and and also to see what other people have concluded uh i think you learned something it, it, it contributes to this uh your kind of your, your kind of mental capital for the next time you're going to write something so uh i'm i mentioned earlier about those uh, about gates and green that uh neither of them have a, have a biography um i don't think i have the wherewithal and the time to write that definitive <laughs> book on green. If if I ever want to see my family again, it probably wouldn't be a good <laughs> idea to hole up at night when I'm home from work and spend hours for years like that. But um, I I may be looking at, at some other projects on Gates, um, comparing his campaign of Saratoga versus Camden in the aftermath. I think that would be very interesting to see, you know, why why did the why did the guy who successfully um you know defeated the first major british army during the war um you know why did he impulsively march to camden and then as as many people know impulsively attacked the british uh by a, a night march with militia and untrained troops who had nothing to eat at 10 o'clock at night not really knowing where the enemy was that's not smart and he was a british officer uh he was a former british officer so um, but any any time any time you can get into the into the records, I think you just you just get more of a feeling for how things how things were back then, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, with that, I'm out of questions. Uh, is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on? Um, I think one more interesting source I would mention is that uh, west of Guilford Courthouse, there uh, was, a, was a, a large community, actually in several towns and villages, uh, inhabited by the Moravians. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the battle and, and starting in the 1750s, I believe uh, Bethabara was founded in 1753 or four. But by the time of the revolution, uh, the, the Moravians uh, which were a German pietist sect that uh, were founded um, around the time of the Reformation and, and had my, many had migrated to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and then many migrated down to current Winston-Salem area. Um, so those villages, they kept a diary um, and they recorded what happened and who came into town and what the weather was like or the minister was sick, or we got, you know, three shillings a pound or for wheat or whatever, that, you know, whatever. Um, those, I, I, I always look at new books coming about, out about particularly North Carolina in the revolution um, to see if those were used. And I didn't, I didn't cite them in this Guilford book. Um, I use it more kind of like as background, so to speak. But their records are very valuable uh, for 
for example, in my dissertation, they provided a lot of information about the violence in the backcountry um, that the Tories came through and accused them of not supporting the crown. Um, but they, they are not digitized as far as I know, that, that might have changed, but they're in about six or seven volumes and three volumes or so cover the revolution. And um, there, there is a very interesting little di diary entry, which I will show uh, a little bit of my conceit, which is that I, look, I found this, whereas some of the experts on the wax saws had never located this, probably because they didn't know of these, these diaries, these published diaries. And as, as you had mentioned earlier about the wax saws, it was, it was a massacre of a lot of troops after they surrendered. And apparently a lot of the, a lot of the Continentals, uh, the ones that were able to escape, they uh, marched north from the wax saws uh, to Charlotte, Salisbury, and some of them stayed at Salem, uh, the village of Salem. Mm -hmm. And one of the entries re remarks that several of the wounded from Buford's massacre, that's what they called it back then. Uh, they didn't really call it the Battle of the Wax Saws, it was Buford's massacre. Mm -hmm. And one of the entries says several something I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of um, several of Buford's men came to recuperate here. One of them said that the massacre started when some of the Continentals picked up their muskets and fired again after surrendering. That's the key to the whole <laughs> Wax Haws battle. Why was there a massacre? Why was there? Why was that? I mean, part of the argument is that somebody shot at Tarleton after he after the surrender, but you know, those those kind of little clues in so many of those sources really add a lot of detail, and and you can really hit on a on a gem every once in a while. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. Well, um, like I said, I've got no more questions for you. I you. deeply appreciate you giving me so much of your time this afternoon. Sure. Um, well, again, just thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. I think anybody who is interested in Guilford Courthouse would really learn from picking up this uh, title. Thank and you. Mr. Moss, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.